Thursday Night Tailgate, where the spotlight is always on the positive. Tune in Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time to hear your favorite NFL legends, players, and coaches sharing their stories. Now back to Chris and Bob. I wouldn't joke about anything else that happened to you tonight. All right, now back with us here on Thursday Night Tailgate is our next guest, Lifford Hobley. Let me remind you about Lifford's background. He's from Shreveport, Louisiana, played his college ball at LSU. He was a third third round draft pick by the Steelers in 1985, and he played in the NFL from 85 to 93 for the Rams and Dolphins as well. And over the course of his career, he had five interceptions, recovered eight fumbles, and returned two of those for touchdowns. And we're excited he is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Leverett, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you, sir. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. How are you? Happy New Year. <laughs> we're we're Happy fantastic. Too. Happy New Year to you as well. Lifford. So uh, how have you been? Catch you, us up. What's been going on? It's been great. And I'm going to tell Rusty, hey, take 65 down to, down to 99. Stay on 99 till you get to 5. I'll meet you in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> there That's you exactly go. how you get out of Pottersville. That's my territory. That's why I work on a daily basis by phone, that entire area where he's living. Wow. How about that? Wow. <laughs> I knew exactly so, where he is. So, Lifford, I, I got to get your your um, your thoughts because as uh, as I was watching the national championship game and knowing you were going to be coming back on the show, uh, you know, a few weeks later, you know, a guy from LSU, right? Now you're looking at a national championship game with Alabama and Georgia in it. Tough to watch for you? No, it wasn't. Actually, you know what? I watched the game. I went to four LSU games this year. Um, I saw a lot of. Uh, LSU defense, really young, and I could see the ability of the team growing into a competitive team in the next couple of years. Uh, but to say that LSU would be competitive as they were this year, uh, yes, we, they, they, we, you know, of course lost the game that they should have lost, uh, got a wake up call in the middle of the season for a homecoming, uh, to lose a game like that and then come back, snap back and just make a run. And then of course, uh, lose kind of a heartbreaker. They were very competitive with Alabama. They had an offer, had some opportunities, uh, just to, just basically say that, hey, there's a coaching change that came at the end of the year, uh, to basically say we, we need to do something different. And it's, it's unfortunate that there's two coaches that have actually been through there offensively and we can't provide a perspective on a quarterback situation where we have all of these great receivers and specialists that have actually gone through there, and uh, we've yet to have an answer at quarterback. Uh, the last time we had one was, uh, you know, Methenberg who came in, but, uh, you know, basically, you know, he's he's been just exactly what he is. Uh, basically a, a really good player, has a great, has a really good opportunity to do things when he's on the field. But he has limits. So LSU getting there was, was fun. But watching Alabama perform at the end of the season, and I felt like Nick Saban has done some things there that are just unbelievable with the respect I have for him as a coach. Uh, also with the respect that I have toward the assistants that have gone through there and be, and, and for them to be as successful as they are. It's like the, it's like the Belichick of college football. And, uh, mm-hmm. that's why, that's how I see Nick Saban. And, you know, those guys are two uh, really good friends and they're, they're pretty much cut from the same mold. So watching those guys work is amazing to watch those two guys work and watch their players basically perform the way they perform at a level that they perform at. And to, to basically see other teams either go into Foxborough or go into Alabama and get chastised because you very seldom see a defense of either Belichick or Saban make more than two to three mental errors a game. And that's their, that's based on how they teach. Uh, it's not watching the game, it's actually playing the game, and that's what, that's what both of them actually set in stone for their players. So when you look ahead to next season for LSU, Right. You, you open, they open the, the season against Miami. Then you've got Auburn a couple of weeks after that. And of course, you got a game against Georgia. You got your game against Alabama. 
Uh, are you confident going into next season? How do you feel about you know what they're going to do next year? I think the spring is going to actually tell the tell uh, offensively how they'll actually come out if the right quarterback uh, or the right scheme is placed in, a, in in place for these kids to be, you know, basically keep it simple and uh, basically use the talent that you have that's available to you and not limit it, the amount of talent that needs to be on the field. If you have to go with three receivers, go with three receivers. If you have to throw the football 20, 30, 35 times a game, throw the football 35 times a game. The defense will win the game for because LSU did not lose very much off the defense. And as you basically, if you watch them play against uh, Pinch, you know, basically in the uh, bowl game in Orlando, they actually played 80% were freshmen that were playing on both sides of the ball. And defensively, they played a lot of, uh, basically a lot of underclassmen. Um, some of the guys opted out, and they were all dressed, but they didn't get an opportunity to play because uh, Coach Ozeron wanted to see what he had for next year. And I thought that was great to actually operate that way. If you really don't want to play, you can dress, but you can stand over here and watch. I, I didn't have a problem with that because today I do have the respect of players uh, opting out of bowl games uh, to if if there is no significant value in the bowl game, but for the school there is uh, because the school gave you an opportunity to be there for on a fellowship. I I really think if you're actually uh, get an opportunity to play in a bowl game with your teammates in the last time, you know, play if you can, but if you're injured. Or if you've been injured during the course of the season and you got an opportunity to go to the next level and make a living for yourself, opt out. Uh, I didn't think uh, uh, Geis would actually play because he had some injuries during his last during the last year of his season. I thought it would have been a good opportunity for him to opt out, but he played and he got his he got his point across and people got to see what what uh, Darius Geis really can do. Five questions for Lifford. Yes, Lifford. I, I, I was just, speaking of kids coming out of college, and uh, I was thinking of guys like yourself when I was watching uh, the Saints uh, play the Vikings, and of course uh, Marcus Williams and the missed tackle, and and it brought me back to Lifford to fundamentals, and um, and and I have to ask a guy like yourself, an expert about uh, playing defensive back. Are these kids coming out of college? It seems like to me, anyway. Tackling has become a lost art. It's more of a collision contact sport, and uh, that uh, that play right there actually cost a team a trip to the uh, trip to the championship game. And uh, you can analyze it in different ways, but overall, Lifford, the kids coming out now are they as fundamentally sound as you you might have been back in the uh, early nineties? Well, you know, when I look and I watch the Seattle Seahawks put on a video, and uh, you have a coach that has basically been in the NFL for many, many years and, you know, as a head coach at Seattle or having a practice, a practice sex session, uh, in certain times of the year on tackling on form tackling on tackling where it's going to be safe for you to tackle. If you didn't learn those techniques as a kid growing up and you're, you're having an issue with going in a certain way or just Going in with your shoulder, I saw a collision between uh, Church and uh, Drakowski last Sunday, and right. you know, uh, basically, that over the past years would wouldn't have been a penalty. But yeah, the, the collision head to head, even though his head was up, and he just basically banged his shoulder into his chest, but their heads banged together. Uh, that was a different way of hitting a big guy like that, you know, back, you know, I would say I would have actually came through him a different way with my shoulder and my arms wrapped around him ripping through the football instead of actually just giving him one shoulder. I'm giving the entire body contact where it's safe for me and safe for him, but definitely still during the ball will lose. So guys are still, uh, I don't think the teaching uh, basically is being done with high school or middle school players uh, that that actually that's effective for them to learn the best way to 
not injure yourself or basically possibly not injure the other player that you're actually trying to tackle. Uh, they've been limited to watching things happen uh, in on video games and other other assets that they have to watch a football game. So that, you know that's that's been neglected for so many years. Protocol the way it is now uh, at every level from from basically Pee Wee leagues all the way to the professional league, where everyone's talking about concussion syndrome and basically what's going on with that. And uh, I think teaching kids and also the college kids on how to perform and tackle is a very important. But to get back to the game where the play actually was developed and the, it didn't end with Mr. Williams, it actually started at the line of scrimmage where you're playing a defense. Uh, people, you know, usually you find guys that actually at corner that are actually the two of the deep guys where you're rushing three players. Uh, playing back there and, and knowing that, yeah, I would have probably been on a 37 defense with three, three defensive linemen and, and basically it's in the game. Where I know I'm protected, uh, pass wise. I'm taking all of my linebackers out and I'm putting defensive backs in the game because I don't want a linebacker to be in a position where he's not used to running, you know, down the field with the receiver. I'm going to match up and put all the guys in the game that I need to match up with. And that's a 38 defense where I can actually count on those, those eight guys that I know that I work every day with as a defensive back coach that they're going to take care of their responsibility. I'm taking my linebackers out of the equation and never putting them in a position like that. And that was basically possibly an opportunity for – that's a coaching point for uh, any NFL coach that actually see a situation like that to understand that defensive backs should be on the field, not linebackers in that situation. And Lippert, Chris had uh, had mentioned the couple touchdowns you had in your own career, back-to-back years, 87 and 88, as a member of the Dolphins. Do you remember both as clear as day, and you, do you still have the footballs? <laughs> you know what? My kid had, my son has the footballs. Uh, of course, the first one was against the Chiefs in 87. I actually creeped across the picket lines to go back and play uh, during the strike season and uh, basically had a really unbelievable game that, that week. And then, of course, to go out to Los Angeles and uh, practice on top of the uh, Marriott because there's a college game going on uh, that weekend at the Coliseum. USC was playing that Saturday. We ended up playing uh, a Sunday game and because we couldn't do our walkthrough to basically score uh, the, I think, the, well, yeah, the first touchdown of the game, and we ended up kicking a couple of field goals, and I think Marino only threw one touchdown. So <laughs> we snuck out of L.A. beating the Raiders uh, for the first time in many, many years in, in Los Angeles, uh, you know, basically as, as the Dolphins actually would alternate between those two areas and play the Raiders maybe one or two years separ- separation and get an opportunity to play out there or even the Raiders coming to Miami. So getting, uh, scoring a touchdown and I think, I'm not sure if Rusty was, I think Rusty had moved on to Seattle by then in 1990. (laughs) So in, well, in 88, I think he was still there, but actually in Detroit. Uh, so we got an opportunity to, uh, get an opportunity to score. I scored it down and, uh, basically holding that lead and being able to beat the Raiders was very important to our season that year. We actually made it to the playoffs, got into a couple of games, and of course, I heard Tony talk about that late, the the early years of the uh, Patriots going in '85 to the Super Bowl against the Bears. I was actually in New Orleans uh, after our season, my season with the uh, St. Louis Cardinals after leaving Pittsburgh, and uh, got an opportunity to watch the game. I didn't go to the game, but. I was in New Orleans watching closely, and you know Tony was a had a short stop over in Miami with me as a teammate and a great great friend and a really good awesome uh, father and friend. And I love what he's doing where he's where he's located, and I wish him all the luck and the kids that are actually he's actually providing source resources for. It's a great great thing he's doing up there. So. 
Lifford, I got to ask you, as, as a guy who spent several years in Miami battling against the Patriots a couple times a year, are you rooting for them as, you know, since they're an AFC team or, or do you look at it like, you know, boy, I, I would never root for a rival that, uh, that we played against like that uh, to win a Super Bowl? Well, guys, you know, Chris, Bob, to be honest with you, um, watching, now Doug Peterson was one of my teammates in Miami for many years as a, as a teammate and a backup quarterback to uh, Dan Marino and uh, for a few years. So I, I'm rooting for Doug a little bit, but Doug, I, I'm sorry, bro. I, I'm an I'm an AFC East guy. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Was like you root for the you root for the Patriots. Well, I root for the AFC every time they play at the Super Bowl. That's why you know. But you know, if there's ever a, a you know, the St. Louis, if ever the Cardinals are in the Super Bowl and they're not playing the Dolphins, uh, I'm probably gonna root for the Dolphins because I earned a paycheck with them as well. And, and Lifford, so the uh, when you play, the Super Bowl, I will be for him. <laughs> when you played, you know, for the Dolphins, and when you were going up against some of those Patriots teams, now you were listed six foot, two hundred and seven pounds, so a pretty big guy for a defensive back. But you had to deal with a couple of, uh, of uh, Patriot tight ends, and, and Lynn Dawson and Russ Francis. Both of those guys, you know, right around as you know, as big as Gronk. I mean, you know, Russ Francis, six six, two forty. What do you remember about going up against those two guys? Well, there, you know, there was there was a difference uh, back, you know, even now. It's not, it wasn't a difference. Those guys were just as physical, and uh, you know, they just like drunk. They used their their weight and, of course, their uh, balance to, you know, separate from. Uh, you basically have to put yourself in a position in between Brogan. And the, and the tight end where if you, you know, like myself, my, fortunate for me, I had, I was strong enough to maintain my balance and also stay away from the guys and, you know, and having the speed as a safety that I had, of course, you know, being a four or five guy and being able to not worry about them running by me was, uh, was a plus and also being physical enough to, you know, keep them from pushing you off and also being, uh, smart enough to know that you have to be smart. You can't, like I said, you can't watch the game. You got to be in it. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the film room and studying what type of things that would go on in certain situations. Um, so until I think Ben Coates, after I was injured, became a phenomenal tight end with the Patriots uh, through the uh, late late night through the night early nineties and on and. Uh, that kind of, he kind of changed things for a lot of, uh, teams to go to tight ends like him, where he was one of those prototype guys that could run, catch the ball and block. So playing against the Patriots, uh, where I got my first sack against Grogan, uh, as a player. And then of course, being able to play against Russ Francis and guys like that. And it, it teaches you a lot. And then of course, you play against cagey guys in practice, like Bruce Hardy. And, uh, you know, you just learn a lot of things because Bruce was one of the smartest and he was one of those tight ends that could run very fast. But he made you look silly because he'd get open on you in a heartbeat. Lifford, before we let you go, remind our listeners what you're doing now. I'm actually working for our organization, uh, Walter Spluer. I Like I said, I work the West Coast. I provide services as a consultant uh, to tax and accounting professionals, CPAs. Uh, enroll agents and tax preparers, uh, accounting and auditing specialists. Uh, I've been in the industry for over 17 years, and I basically love what I do on a daily basis. I'm also uh, the NFL alumni chapter president here in Dallas, uh, Caring for Kids program. We are actually busy getting out in the community and helping kids and also our veterans that are actually disabled and also homeless. We have an initiative that we're working on with um, a, a, one of the huge restaurants here uh, in the Dallas area to start an initiative here. I don't, I don't want to say anything about it because I don't want anybody else to steal their idea until we get it up and running. But this is going to be awesome, an awesome year for us to partner with an organization to help the homeless veterans, not only in Dallas, but in other areas of the country as well. 
So, Lifford, how can our listeners stay up to date with all the things you're doing? Let us let us know. How can we follow you on uh, online or over social media? Well, we have a we actually are starting to have a Facebook page for the NFLalumni.org. And uh, if there's anything you need to know about what's going on in your area that the NFL alumni around the country are doing for kids, go to our NFLalumniWebsite.org and click on your chapter city, and you'll find out what our guys, who the presidents are, who you know, who's involved in your city, and basically go out and support the organization in a way that that hasn't been done before. There's a lot of things going on that we're actually doing with the NFL through the NFL alumni, basically kids programs that they could take advantage of, not only in sports, but life examples as well. It's really great stuff, Lifford. Thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come back on the show. When you're ready to announce something, I hope you'll let me know and we'll get you back on because, uh, you know, we, we've been partnering with the NFL Alumni Association for several years now. We're big supporters and, and we know you guys do great stuff for kids and for the, you know, your peers as, as the alumni. So kudos to you and uh, all the other chapter presidents for all the great stuff you're doing around the country. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me on and I love to come back and, uh, Let's go Patriots. <laughs> there you go. All right. Take Always care, Lippert. We'll catch up with you again real soon. In between now and then, all the best to you and your family. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Good night. Take care, Lippert. That's former LSU and Miami Dolphins defensive back Lifford Hobley. We've got our next guest, Mark Collins, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Mark right on the other side of this real quick station break. <laughs> 